Um, so Ruth, Dorit, and Rehan, welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm sure it's not an easy day for you. And I hope you're inspired as much as I am to see so many faces on screen, so many young faces listening to our conversation. And it'll be interesting to see and think about the differences between your experience of growing up um, and those of uh, some of our guests. So I would like to start the conversation by asking each of you to briefly share with us, where did you grow up and what was your childhood like? Um, Dorit, do you wanna start please? Well, good evening everybody. And of course, thank you very much for coming and joining us because it is learning and sharing. That's what it is all about. And you can never be too young or too old to learn and to fight for what is right and what is wrong. Fighting for freedom is worthwhile anytime. I was only five years old when Belgrade was bombed. We were still in bed and we woke up because we were choking from the fire and the smoke. So we tried to get out of the building and there were 20 people living in the same building and it was very hard to get out. When we got onto the road, it was a stampede. Everybody was running. At five, I didn't know who was shooting at us because they didn't leave a visiting card. The bombs were fell down and how are you to know at five years what it is? I have never seen a bomb before. So we had to escape and we ran into the woods. But at that time, it was nothing to do with anti-Semitism. We were just all running for our lives. Then after we spent this time in the woods, my mother, because she was Hungarian, she wanted to go back to Budapest. She only came to marry my dad. So we all went then to Budapest and we, my mother was a teacher. In Yugoslavia, she was teaching ballet and art in uh, the Yugoslav courts. So with four, I was already stage struck because I danced in front of the King of Yugoslavia with the age of four. And at that time I decided, yes, that's the life for me. That's what I want to do, do. I want to be a famous singer and dancer. But of course the Germans and the Nazis and the anti-Semites had different ideas. We arrived to Budapest. My mom was carrying me on her back and we were walking. I understood yesterday that it is 250 miles. Well, I didn't know that. And uh, we arrived to Budapest and within about a few months, everything let loose. And it was, I walked with my mom into a park and there was a big woman and she spat in my eyes and called me Bido Jido, which means thinking Jew. Well, I was only five and a half years old and I didn't even know what it means to be Jewish because we were not religious. And of course that was a time and suddenly my mom, I thought she would spit back at this woman, but she didn't. I was quite disappointed because my mom would look, she was like a tiger. Anybody looked at me and she would go, Ooh. but of course she understood that the this time it was not just a little conflict, that it was much more than that. And of course she realized on the way home, everything, it was full of tannoys, kill the Jews. It was announced that everybody had to wear a yellow star of David, the Magen David. And suddenly the Jews were, Hungary was very anti-Semitic. And apparently Hungarians during the war, war killed more Jews than the Germans and the other people put together. I spent the war running and hiding. I was picked up by the Nazis twice and put into a, a, a sorting house before they put me in a gas chambers, but I managed with other helps to run away. And uh, basically, my mother changed her identity and she bought herself a uniform like a nurse. So she changed, she became a Red Cross nurse and she put bandage around my face 
so we were walking the streets all the time because it was not safe to be at home or something because people would go from house to house. And if anybody stopped us, she would just say, I'm taking this little child, never said that I was her daughter, I'm taking her to the child children's hospital. She just had an accident. And so we were hiding most of the war. We didn't get any coupons because we were hiding, so we didn't exist. And we were always just a step ahead. But at night, my grandma was there as well, and we would scavenge. We would eat, we would go and scavenge dustbins in front of posh hotels and hospitals. And we would just take out of never meat because it was not edible, but potato peels and anything. So we lived off that and we had bread. So we eat. So to cut a long story short, by the time I was nine, we were liberated. I weighed three and a half stone. I had no hair. I had pleurisy and pneumonia, and I couldn't stand on my feet because I was so undernourished. The Russians liberated us, and we went back to Yugoslavia, to only to find that from a big family that we had, I was the only survivor. Everybody was killed. And uh, we heard that my father, by the time he was 29, he worked four years in a, some kind of a mine, hacking stones. He was 29 when he died, starved and worked to death. So at, as it is Yom HaShoah, it, you realized it actually that what a catastrophe that was, that people are being persecuted just because they were Jewish. So this is, this is why I feel that as a Jewish woman, I cannot stand by and say nothing when on the other side of the world, some people have got a parallel persecution. And because they have got a different religion and speak a different tongue, we are all the same. I deeply believe that we, regardless of color, creed, or religion, it is always all of us are us. And when humanity realizes it, it is not them and us, then perhaps people are going to be more understanding and don't just fight and, and think it is wrong if your next door neighbor got, gets hurt or persecuted. I have never been to China. I never met a Uyghur person except Rehana. But I feel very strongly in the parallel. And whilst people have to know about it, especially young people, they have to understand that it is freedom is always worth fighting for. And I will always stand up and say something because if during the Holocaust and all this anti Semitism, more people would have spoken up to, then I'm sure there would have been a few thousand more Jews alive. And this is why I think it is so important that the young people should know and stand up for the right things. Thank you. Thank you, Dorit, uh, for sharing your story, but also your words of inspiration and, and action. Um, Ruth, you came here with your brother Martin. You were three years old, Martin was seven on the Kinder's transport. Um, for those who don't know what the Kinder transport was and the role it played in shaping um, your future, uh, and, but also that of your families, um, could you tell us a little bit about that and also about the significance of having Martin with you? Um, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk with an audience, um, which I willingly do because my life was completely changed by the Holocaust, by coming to England on the kinder transport. Um, my identity was so messed up from being moved around that it was 50 years before I could face the past and begin to unscramble my identity and find my true self, which I have been able to do with the right kind of help at 
just the right kind of time. But not everybody, the 10,000 children who came to England on the kinder transport, were able to do this. And some lived a very much messed up life because they didn't get the chance to do so. That is why I like to tell my story to people, because it is still happening around the world in many places to families today. Families are being separated and traumatized and it's very difficult to get a family together again after they've been so deeply traumatized under such conditions. And uh, what absolutely appalls me is that the world in general turns a blind eye and a deaf ear to what is going on. And so far, we have not stopped any genocide before it's run its course. And very few um, uh, victims and survivors have had any justice and very few perpetrators have so far been held to account. And therefore, I want to raise awareness of this, that a civilized human race would simply not allow genocide to continue and would have got rid of war by now, which is usually the cover under which uh, genocide happens, though it's not a war in the case of the uh, persecution and genocide against the Uyghur. I was born in Berlin. Uh, my father was a judge. My mother ran a state-of-the-art cinema advertising business. We had a golden future in front of us until the Nazis came to power in 1933 and inside a year had destroyed all that for the Jewish community. By 1939 and the horrendous attack on Jewish communities in every city across Germany and Berlin, Kristallnacht, the writing was on the wall that it wasn't going to blow over. It was almost too late for most people to get out, but um, my parents managed to get my brother, age seven, and myself, age four, to England on the kinder transport. Um, that was a major rescue, uh, sanctioned by the British government, but uh, not actually done by the British government. It was left to uh, philanthropic organizations and individuals to do the actual work quickly of forming a network to get the children out. 10,000, there would have been more if war had not broken out at that time. A major rescue, but it was not the end for the children, it was the beginning of a very hard childhood. Um, my brother and I were in three foster families and a hostel. Each time we were moved on very hurriedly, no preparation, not taking anything more than uh, the clothes we were in and what we could carry, um, which was very disorienting. Now, at four years old, I really didn't understand what was happening. And I experienced it as being rejected by my parents as too naughty, too rubbishy, they didn't want me anymore. Um, I was quite used to being uh, left with my granny, uh, my Christian granny. My mother was uh, not Jewish um, and my mother would come and pick me up again after a day or two. So that was quite usual to be taken on a long journey, uh, I remember quite clearly, and then left with strangers I'd been introduced to. Um, it was it was only when my mother didn't come and didn't come and didn't come that at some point it hit me. She was never going to come. She had rejected me as rubbish. Um, that was unbearable. So in my mind, she must be dead. Otherwise, she'd be with me. 
um, it was too unbearable to think she chose to be somewhere else. Um, for my brother, it was different. He remembers uh, his first home in Germany. I have only snatches of memory. Uh, my first home was in England, but it was a very tenuous home. The first foster family was a disaster. Um, a kindly vicar uh, who was a lovely man, but his wife had no children of her own. I think she was his second wife. And I, she really didn't want to look after uh, two refugee children who are not easy to look after. They're desperately homesick. They don't understand a word. They can't grasp why everything is so different to what they're used to at home. And when the war began and uh, our mother didn't come to pick us up and take us to where our father escaped to, uh, which was the plan, she turned on us uh, because it was um, quite, um, the myth was very much believed in England the myth the Nazis created that the Jews had started the First World War and now they were starting another war. Um, we were very unhappy until the Quakers who sponsored us, each of the 10,000 children had to be sponsored by somebody responsible. The Quakers realized we were unhappy and sent us to a lovely Quaker boarding school, which really saved our sanity. Um, we were treated exactly the same as everybody else there. But for me, the damage had been done. I felt useless, worthless, uh, passed on. Um, I desperately wanted to be like the other children, but I knew I wasn't. Um, two years uh, at that lovely boarding school, when our foster father died and the vicarage had to be vac vacated. We were put in a hostel in Richmond for children whose homes had been flattened in the London Blitz, uh, a very overcrowded, unsanitary hostel, uh, um, uh, not very well supervised, but people were friendly, which made it possible for us to survive there. They found a second foster family with five children and they treated us exactly the same as their own children. So we fit in there very quickly. Um, and we were very happy there for a year until the doodlebugs came over. Uh, the flying bombs catapulted by the Germans from the Belgian coast. Uh, which was very exciting because we were living in the path of the doodlebugs. So they put guns all around where we were living to try and stop them getting to London. Um, and they came over at night and we would be woken by the siren and it was an exciting experience. But not for my brother, who by then was about 12. He knew they, these bombs were coming from Germany, where he knew his mother was, or he believed she was still there. So he experienced the doodlebugs as if his mother was throwing bombs at him. And if you believe that, you really can't cope with it. He went berserk and we had to, he had to be moved. And they found a third foster family who didn't think that two children should be parted if they'd been together through the war. And they were right. We didn't even know it ourselves, how important we were to each other at that time. Uh, I didn't want to leave my buddy Joan, um, one of the daughters of the second family, the same age as me, but we could write to each other and telephone. So I settled in quite quickly to the third family, which was a farm. And I loved the animals on the farm. The war ended just after we came to the third family. We had celebration parties, but nothing changed. All the restrictions went on. And four years after the end of the war, I was 14 
And I had decided in my mind that at the end of that school year, I was going to leave school and become a farmer. And I was really happy about that. I was very, very good with the animals. I was going to raise animals. And I really thought that was as good as life can possibly get. Until one day, my mother appeared out of nowhere. That's how I experienced it, because grown-ups made the arrangements and then they told you. I was told, this is your mother and she's going to take you to Germany with her. That was the last straw. I had been thoroughly brainwashed with British propaganda against Germany all through the war, on the radio, the comics I read, the newspaper. Everything was about nasty Nazis and that terrible place, Germany. And I simply wasn't going to go there. I completely refused. Um, my mother had to go back all on her own, which must have been terrible for her to be so rejected. But I couldn't connect with her. I couldn't even work out whether she was a real person or a ghost come back from a grave. And moreover, I didn't want to. Uh, I wanted to be 101% English. I didn't want to have anything to do with Germany. I might have been willing to go to America. That was an exciting place. But Germany was simply terrifying for me. Um, when my mother got back to Germany, my father had returned from Shanghai, where he spent 10 years over the war period. Um, he had difficulty getting back to Europe. And uh, he served a court order on my foster foster mother who I really thought I could trust had to take me to Germany and leave me there which was like the kinder transport in reverse a second time everything I was used to had disappeared and I was all alone in a terrifying place Germany really was a terrifying place for a good 10 20 years after the end of the war I couldn't cope. Uh, I refused to do anything my parents wanted. I would run off and get lost. And I threatened to um, make my way north and, and hide on a boat to get back to England, at which point my parents said that I could go back to England if I promised to stay at school and visit them every school holiday, which of course I did and gradually got to know Germany and German people and lose my fear but England has always been my home no way could I ever settle in Germany that was the worst year in my life it took a year to get back to England because I had no nationality and I had to travel out to Germany in 1949 with a document which had person of no nationality across the top a nasty piece of paper that is why I've called my autobiography for schools person of no nationality because you tried traveling with a piece of paper that says person of no nationality across the top and everybody looks at you as a freak and a fraud and that was burnt into my mind and it completely messed up my uh, identity. I tried to be 101% English until I was 54 and one of the kinder of the kinder transport organized a 50th anniversary reunion of our coming to England, at which point I had a stable career as a teacher, a stable marriage, three teenagers, and I felt strong enough to face the past, which I did very quickly. And quite soon after that started talking in schools to help the teachers when they had to teach the Holocaust in 1991 suddenly with no preparation, no courses for teachers beforehand and I've been doing it ever since. Thank you Ruth. Um, you, you, I've known you now for almost six years and you have always been a force to be reckoned with, but this is a whole new side. 
And I think it speaks whether you're first generation Holocaust survivor, second generation, whether you were on burning Europe at the time or here in the UK, the, the effects of whether yourself or members of your family. Uh, Rehan, your brother Ex Eckpart, um, yesterday you sadly marked the fifth anniversary since he was forcibly uh, detained by the Chinese government after actually visiting you, uh, being uh, representing his generation as a young leader. And you and your family have paid a very high price, first for leaving China and then also for speaking out. Um, you are the, the equivalent of the second and third generation being affected. What is your current contact with your family and what is the impact that this has had on you um, in the last five years? Thank you very much, Mia. In fact, um, you know, just by sheer coincidence, my brother's anniversary coincided with the eve of Holocaust Remembrance Day, as well as the genocide against Tutsis in Rwanda uh, and two or three anniversaries all get together. Um, I think, I mean, just listening to these two remarkable women's stories, like, you know, and just looking at me, I think one thing, you know, it is clear that during genocide can happen and again and again. And that's why I like, you know, thank you so much for all these wonderful organizations who remind us that the importance of both the Holocaust education and genocide ed education. Um, at this moment, um, it took me four years to finally decide and to have the ultimate courage that, you know, private advocacy is not working. Um, when it comes to China, I think we do have this very different understanding. It's a very different culture. They don't like this Western way of like being a very fierce advocate, like you need to work within the system, like be quiet, try to like, you know, reach out to their better angels and get your brother out. And I've tried that. I've tried that route at the advice of many China experts and none of that worked out. So last year was the first time that I spoke at my alma mater where my brother was supposed to come to my graduation and he never made it. And just remembering that day, I kicked off my campaign and started with the New York Times later, which is a major publication at the top in the US. And so this past year has been relentless. Um, I've been just like advocating for my brother, but uh, sadly, um, my parents are in, still in China. So my communication with them are very much limited. And, you know, I guess like one could imagine like, you know, the, the profound love like, you know, siblings have towards each other. And what I'm going through is so beyond uh, big. I think it's just so painful. We have a beautiful Uyghur saying that says, there are three things in your life that are so important to you. And there are only three. One is the mother and one is the father and the third is your sibling. Um, but I think my pain is best understood by my parents because they're exactly living this nightmare as well. Their son is being taken away from them. And had we at least been provided the opportunity to share the struggle, because we did lose him in, in some ways. He's, he's kept as a hostage and he's kept in these concentration camps but we came and talk about him like each time my my communication with my parents are monitored so they're too afraid to even acknowledge that my brother is in these camps so um i think the impact of it is that i, I wish sometimes like you know of course i can embrace them even virtually but at least that i wish they could lean on to me and, and just tell me like how much they're missing him or longing for his return or hope this nightmare is over and it, it's so painful that my parents couldn't even say those precious words and be able to to say like my daughter like you know I miss my son and I think that is the most painful part but also it takes away this the power of relationship you my relationship with my parents too I think that the Chinese government not only took my 
brother, but also took away my parents. Because like now our conversation has been so limited to just small talk. Like, you know, we talk about, oh, like how's the COVID in the United States? Like, are you, uh, are you eating well? Like, you know, how's your work? And, but we can't talk about those profound feelings and the pain that we're going through. And that would make the relationship so powerful because we share, we share like, you know, today, like we got to learn these wonderful individual stories. And now we felt like we're kind of bearing witness to Dory's and Ruth's childhood, but me and my parents, we couldn't do that. So it takes away that intimate connection that you have with your parents. So, um, and then that's why, like, I always advise people, like, you know, when you do have family members beside you, we never know, like, what can happen, right? Like, because in comparison, I did have a better childhood. I had a loving family, and look at how my life turned out now. So um, it's important that we cultivate that relationship with our siblings, with our parents, while they're still with us. And I think for me, like, that's a one important thing that I learned is, um, you know, having a voice is a privilege and we need to lend that voice to others who are suffering, but at the same time, really cherish those around us, including all of the people who are sharing this moment together virtually and hearing these uh, stories of this two incredibly remarkable moment. Thank you, Mia. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Rayhan. Um... If there's anything um, that those of us who thankfully haven't experienced the Holocaust directly, um, we know the importance of family. Just the last year, those who have been um, unable to meet, talk to family, uh, hug loved ones, the ones we love, the ones we fight with, but just knowing that the option is there, I think, I could never understand what it is to go and experience what you and, and Ruth and Doreen and so many others have directly experienced. Um, but yeah, really powerful. Um, Dorit and Ruth, since arriving in the UK, you, you each through your journey, which you shared with us, really have taken it upon yourselves, not only to tell your story, um, but to make sure that other stories are also heard. And only recently, you firmly challenged the UK cover, uh, Parliament and indeed Boris Johnson himself to vote on a genocide amendment to the trade bill, which would recognize China's actions towards the Uyghurs as genocidal. Um, earlier today, Ruth, you shared with me your concern and frustration after the response you received from Volkswagen uh, for challenging the company's presence in uh, Uyghur region in China and its involvement in Uyghur forced labor. You said giving the bully, giving into the bully um, is only going to make it worse. So why is it so important for you to educate people about human rights abuses today rather than just the experiences of the Holocaust? Um, either one of you, Ruth or Dorit, uh, Ruth, you're muted. Okay. Um, yes, I'm deeply disturbed by the answer I got from uh, Volkswagen uh, headquarters in London or Germany, uh, which was a long list of uh, details about their policy of this, that and the other. Um, and at the same time, I read in the media uh, about um, organizations changing their websites and uh, withdrawing things about their policy um, uh, demanded by the CCP. Um, and I'm appalled at the dishonesty and how... Um, economic preservation is uh, again and again given priority over the suffering of people. And this is repeated with every genocide that has been so far that uh, the majority 
majority of people the world over simply don't want to know. They feel it's not their business. Why should they do anything at all? And the one thing that I try to get across when I'm given the chance to talk with audiences is that it is the people who do nothing and think that they are squeaky clean because they've not done anything bad, have actually done the worst possible thing, which is to collude with the perpetrators. It's the people who do nothing, passively, passively turn a blind eye, are actually enabling the perpetrators to get away with it. And this is what appalls me. They do get away with it. Very, very few perpetrators of genocide have so far been held to account. And because they get away with it, the next lot of brutal, selfish leaders know they can get away with it. When are we going to stop this? impunity created by every genocide that we don't stop in its tracks but allow to take its course and then we beat our breasts and say never again which is a hollow sham i want some honesty i'm i'm, I'm with you ruth david do you have anything to you would like yes. to learn well, unfortunately, we are looking to establish what is the price for a human being. Because it looks as though you're weighing up, this is how much profit we make out of a person who is working slave labor. If we didn't have him, this is how much we would lose. But that individual who is doing all the work and the country who is profiting out of it, that person doesn't exist as a person. It is just a means to an end. But if one goes out and thinks about it, how did it get to it? Why is it so cheap? So people are not willing to give up their comforts because they might have to pay a little bit more for a shirt or a car like Volkswagen or perhaps whatever is being produced in, in China at the moment by the people who are being a slave, the people who are in concentration camps. I feel very uncomfortable and disgusted to feel that we are giving them a bonus, making, supporting them. I would rather not drive a car, but knowing that those people who are working on the car has earned the money fair and square, not by being slave labor, and then I can get a cheaper car. The whole situation seems to be not just unfair, but that the people are just accepting it. And they don't stand up. I mean, Ruth and I are not teenagers anymore. We've got fire in our belly than many 20 years. Having been there, having gone through, you have standing in empathy. And both of us, like it's, I just feel I want to shake people up and say, now look, what would you do if it was your brother? Would you ignore that? And the governments are playing the game with each other. They're competing economy and commerce. But it is the people who count. It seems to be that everything priority is commerce. And the people, the, 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 the value of humanity is getting less and less. Now, I went through... I also, I was stateless. I didn't have a passport. And I was, uh, I traveled the Middle East because the only way that I could survive, I had to become a dancer in the Middle East. 
and uh, because I, no country would let me anywhere in. And then I saw an advert when I stayed with my stepfather's parents that they're looking for a ballet dancer for a theater in Istanbul. I signed up for it and there were 12 girls. And then I was very small, very little, and we were all on stage and they looked at me and I had leotards on and they said to me, what are you doing here? I said, what do you mean? I signed up. But I looked at them and there were sort of 16 and 18 year old girls and they all had boobs and very, very developed. I was flat chested like a board. So I said, what do you mean? I'm a very good dancer. Yes, but you, what did you sign up for? I signed up for a ballet dancer. I've got a certificate, but you signed up for a belly dancer. Now you need totally different attributes to a belly dancer than to a ballet dancer. But I had no choice because I was hungry. I didn't have a passport. I had been thrown out from every country, especially because I was Jewish. Israeli passport wouldn't have done me any good because I was in Israel as well. And nobody was there to one thing to say to me, look, you're a nice little Jewish girl. You don't need to belly dance in nightclubs where everybody's ogling at you. Come on, we'll help you get an education. I got my education. I was going to school during the day and dancing at night. Standers. There must have been loads of people who must have wondered what is this child doing in a nightclub trying to be a belly dancer without a belly and without any boobs. But no. Now, if I would have seen somebody like this, I would have done something about it. And this is what I'm trying to say to you in a very roundabout way. There must be children who are in the concentration camp. There must be young people, any kind of people who are being mistreated. Even the people in China must see that. I have nothing against the Chinese people. Neither is Ruth. We are both respecting. But it is just those few who are taking it upon themselves not to respect other human beings. It's not even that they are doing it to the people in Congo. They are doing it to the people that they were born in their own country. And they must have some kind of understanding that it is wrong. So I feel that I just have to do something. And when I go around speaking to schools, and this is something that's to educate people and to just tell them, look, you are having a good life at the moment, make the best of it. And after everything, if you work on it, nobody is going to knock on your door and say, look, how would you like me to buy your new car? Or how would you like me to do this? You have to work for it. But if you work for it, and you have it, then you know, must not become selfish. You have to share it. You have to make sure that everybody else has got a freedom. And this is why freedom to me is the most worthwhile feeling to fight for. It's freedom. And all those people who are being locked up against their will, it's not that they have done something bad. It's not that they are paying for their sins. Just like we, all our faults, I mean, we were Jewish and that's why we were killed and persecuted. Surely that's not a crime. Equally, those people who are Uyghurs, they didn't choose. That's how they were born. And why are they now being singled out? So whoever, it doesn't matter. And, and I hope that all of us who are now fighting for the right thing to do, if anything else comes up, we are going to be the first ones Aren't we, Ruth? Absolutely. Because it is you just, if you got life and you got the power, maybe you are not going to be change the whole world. But if many of us are having a word and we do it together, then our children's children will have a future. You have to start the future now before it's too late. Your turn. Everybody got very quiet now. I'm, yeah, conscious, yeah. Of, I'm conscious of time. I just want to ask Rehan, mm -hmm. is there hope? I mean, you hear Dorit and you hear Ruth speaking with both compassion, but also determination and commitment. 
are you hopeful? What, you know, if Ekper were here and we were able to ask him, what, what do you think he would say? What would the Uyghur people say? You know, I think um, if he knows like the amount of advocacy and us even mentioning his name, like, you know, saying the victim's name is an incredibly important issue. When somebody is dehumanized and when they lost their voice and agency, but also in, in the, such indignified way, there's somebody outside the world actually like calling for their name and trying to raise awareness. That's the best thing one can do to the human being, to their soul, and, and let them know that they're not forgotten to begin with. But also like the, there are people who perhaps come from a different race, religion, and color and creed, but because of our shared humanity that we are calling his name, we are remembering him, we are trying to save him. And that collective effort would send a hope. Is there hope? Absolutely. The very fact that, um, you know, Somebody like, you know, Ruth and Dori who are so energetic and trying to like make the world better because they understand they had this lived experience, like how hate can ruin families, like, you know, people are separated. And then look at these wonderful youth advocates like Jonathan, the old Bursa Bubble, and yet again, Jaya. When I see like they're wearing my brother's name to tell the world that, you know, Akbar's life matters. It doesn't matter if you're Uyghur. For me, you're my fellow human being. Your life matters. And the injustice that is happening to you, it could happen to me. That's why I lend my support and I'll speak out. And when we show this collective effort to the Chinese government that we're not going to remain bystanders to when such a um, mass atrocity is happening against innocent people, when children are separated from their families. Because at the end of the day, we must remember this. Mass atrocities are often rendered as successful. But Akbar is somebody's brother, somebody's son, somebody's boyfriend, a neighbor, a loving guy. And by doing that, we're not only humanizing this cause, but also sending the Chinese government that Uyghur's lives matter. And I think for far too long, there is this notion deeply ingrained in the Chinese government that, um, you know, it, it because of its uh, political muscle and economic currency, it can get away with even like holding people in the concentration camps. The world would look the other way. But now we're saying that we're not gonna look the other way. We're not saying like, we're gonna, well, you know, we didn't know, we do know, and we're taking action. And, you know, the, the very fact that, you know, Ruth took the initiative to write the letter to Volkswagen to say, what are you doing with these slave labor? I mean, that is such a powerful thing one can do to, as a, conscious consumer, we need to ask these companies, like, are, are you going to be a company that would be committed to ethical sourcing or a company that would profit off a slavery? You know, and, you know, any Jewish person understand that forced slavery, all this are, you know, suggesting a chilling parallels to what happened. And I have in no way trying to mitigate what happened during the Holocaust. But what the Uyghur people are suffering right now is also in the happening in 21st century, and it is unimaginable and unspeakable. So um, I say that, you know, I see a lot of hope, and I see hope through these kind of very much engaging discussion. I see it through the compassion of Ruth and Dory and Jonathan and Jaya, um, Noah and Ellie, all these wonderful advocates who came here in, in one goal, we're gonna save human lives. We're gonna fight for human freedom and human dignity. And that's the kind of the world that I wanna live in, where a person wouldn't be persecuted because of their race, color, or religion. And that's what we're trying to achieve. So I do, I am hopeful. And I think that, uh, I just hope like, you know, when we do these kind of like uh, events to raise awareness, we turn, we translate this into further action. 
And that's why, like, you know, I mean, first of all, this incredibly great job. Mia, you do an incredibly great job. And like, I was so moved by the joint letter Ruth and um, Dory send it to the parliament to say like, you know, we've lived through this and we're, when we say it never again, we really mean it. We say it on behalf of the Uyghur people because they're our fellow human beings too. So I see a lot of hope and I, I hope that, you know, our collective action would actually not only spark conversation across the globe, but also deter the Chinese government. And I think the way we do it is exactly what Bruce did by asking our companies and hold them accountable and ask them to change because they do have power over the Chinese government as well. Ask them to change the behavior of the Chinese government. So um, I say thank you for giving me hope, but uh, let's just work together and, and just end human suffering. Um, in this century, this should not be allowed. Thank you, Rayhan, and for sharing um, your hope, and but also your fears and your determination. Um, I'm conscious of time, and I would like to ask our guests, um, please stay with us. I know some of you have questions that you would like to ask Dorit and Rayhan and Ruth, um, but it was too good of a conversation to stop <laughs> when we originally planned. Um, before we move on to questions and answers, um, I just wanna say how humbled I am to share this platform with the three of you. Um, and not just because, uh, and how at all I am with not only your sense of what's right and fair, but also your admirable commitment to pursue it um, and support others to achieve it. Um, I would like now to move on to some questions and enabling our audience to ask some questions and answers. And for that, I'm inviting um, Jonathan Gibson, a young, inspiring um, individual who has set up Burst the Bubble UK. Um, and Jonathan, if you could please make yourself visible. Um, we will probably spend approximately 10 minutes um, answering some questions and then um, proposing actions. So all of you who are inspired by what you've heard, uh, there are ways for you to use that um, to an act now before it's too late. Um, Jonathan. Thank you very much, Mia. And thank you very much, um, Dorit, Ruth, and Rayhan, for that really interesting discussion. It's an honor every time hearing you speak. Um, so I thought, obviously, it's possible, so I might try and merge some of the questions, if that's okay. So maybe we can start with a question from Irene. This is probably directed towards Rayhan. So um, Irene's asked, um, I would love to know when the persecution of the Uyghurs began and what were life for them was like before the Chinese government government turned on them and then possibly also extending that on to what was the effects on you of the Chinese government turning against your brother and the experiences that you've yeah um you know I mean growing up there's always some form of discrimination because I mean you're ethnic minority in a country predominantly um is kind of homogenous. Um, you have the majority Han Chinese and uh, ethnic minorities, but Uyghurs and Tibetans are more resistant towards assimilation, so we try to maintain our culture. Um, but I mean, even then, like, you know, there's still opportunities for you to survive, and I survived, so did my brother, who became this very sensational tech entrepreneur. But also, he's such a kind hearted person that he was so committed and remained committed to philanthropy and helping kids with disabilities and elderly people because they, he believed in the wisdom of elderly people. Um, but since 2016, uh, we had this new governor, and he really believed that, you know, um, he, uh, he even used like this very incredibly dehumanizing language that the government must break the roots, break the origin and break the lineage of the Uyghur people. So he doesn't believe that Uyghur culture language or Uyghur identity should survive. Like 
not only thrive, but also like, you know, survive. So, and, and that kind of targeted approach. And I think obviously underneath of it is racism and hate, you know, those are the driving policy of him and as well as the Chinese government. And that's when the Chinese government start to like interning or detaining people and including people like my brother who once was celebrated by the Chinese government itself as a successful entrepreneur. So since 2016, like nobody could escape from these concentration camps. Any person can be a potential target. If I do ever go back, and despite me being an attorney, I'm the perfect target for these concentration camps. And the impact on me is like obviously incredibly uh, painful because you, every time you speak out, like you're afraid, you know, what would that happen to, to my parents? Like, would they cut off my connection with my family? And this is what I mean that, you know, not everybody can speak up. When you know, speaking truth to power and being vulnerable to share your story, it requires courage. But for some, there's ultimate risks and cost to pay. Like when when I, you know, there was a time like even like now, like I learned that my brother has held in solitary confinement, that like my parents are under harassment. And, and sometimes like, you know, like they cry and all these sort of things, my advocacy is also causing them some form of scrutiny or pain and they just can't discuss about it. You mentioned the dehumanization. This is actually, I met you, I think it was last year and we conducted a big campaign, which I might mention later, as you can see part of it is to humanize people. And we got these t-shirts um, to try and humanize the individuals because often you hear these big numbers and you hear the millions and you don't think about the individual people and I think that's really really important um, and that's how we form connections as human beings and I know that me personally and all of our ambassadors and team have been really inspired by Rayhan as well as Ruth and Dorit and hearing their stories. So I want to move on to um, there was a question from Annette, who's asked, um, what happened to your brother Ruth after the war ended and how did his reaction to the rediscovery of your parents differ from your own at that later period? Um, yes, that's an important question because my brother's story and mine diverge at this point. Our parents considered that Martin at almost 18 was adult enough to make his own decision. And he decided to stay in England because he was doing a scholarship to Cambridge University. They did not give me the same choice, which I bitterly resented. I was treated as a minor a child. And if you treat a 14 year old like a four year old, you really have got trouble. Understandably, our parents wanted their four year old, even if they couldn't have their seven year old back. And uh, they really had no idea how to deal with teenagers. Why would they? Um, so Martin went to Cambridge University. Whilst he was there, he met a very nice German au pair girl. They fell in love and got married and they chose to settle in Germany. Now, if you choose to do something, you make it work. If you're forced to do something that feels absolutely unbearable, then it's not going to work. Um, my brother had a very hard time the first 20 years after the war. Germany was a very bad place for Jews to return to. The anti-Semitism did not evaporate overnight. Anti-Semitism went underground, but it was very strongly there. My brother was rejected when he applied for jobs with a Cambridge University degree, he was told, we only employ people with a German degree, go and get a German degree. The university would not allow him on a PhD course unless he went and got a German degree. Now that is sheer spite. And he didn't want to go over the same ground. So he went in by the back door. He got himself into research programs. Uh, he was welcomed by the researchers, but of course they could only pay him as a bottle washer. 
So he earned his living by doing translation and he was one of the first to develop computers when they started to come in. And there's a story about how his bank sent him a note saying that he was overdrawn by several thousand pounds. And he wrote a letter back telling them exactly what was wrong with their computer. So he got the job of putting their computer right. Um, uh, he would have had a much better time if he had stayed in England. And he could have gone to Germany to visit our parents like I did. I kept my promise and came out every uh, holiday. I've been going to Germany at least two or three times a year ever since 19, 1951 when I came back to England. Um, uh, and uh, he would have, he, he might have, he was a, interested in cosmology and he had a theory that he said um, uh, was more realistic than Hawking's theory. He, he uh, respected Hawking but said that his theory was only mathematically correct but totally out of touch with reality, whereas his theory uh, was built on reality. I don't know enough physics to judge on that. Um, and I think we've got quickly time possibly for one more question. Um, and I'll send this to Dora if that's okay. So um, I've seen personally on my own social media feeds um, how China have really tried to manipulate what's going on and put out propaganda videos and so how much of a role do you think this plays and can you see any sort of echoes to what was happening there in terms of the propaganda to try and cover up what was going on with Nazi Germany? It is very much, it is vilifying people. It is making people into some villains so that people have a reason why to dislike them. Uh, they accuse all the Jewish people, the Nazis that they were, stealing the money from the human, from the Germans, and that's why Germany got into such, uh, uh, they don't have work, they're, they're, they're jobless, and it was a big blame game. And it is almost as though the Chinese government or whoever is in charge of that are taking like a, a carbon copy and reading it like out of a handbook that this is what Hitler has done and Nazi Germany, and it worked for them. And uh, now it must work for the, for the people who are uh, using the Uyghur people as slaves. So history does repeat itself, but uh, we have got at least, especially I'm very pleased to come to England. And I came to England because I believe that it is democracy here. And also England is one of the few people places where the Jewish people after the Holocaust were quite welcome. And also during, I had friends who have never gone through anything like this, who were quite allowed to keep on the Jewish culture and they had a synagogue and they had a life here. I mean, anti-Semitism is everywhere, but at least in England, if somebody is accusing you face to face with anti-Semitism, that you are free to do whatever you feel and speak back to them. And you're not afraid that if you speak up against it that you're gonna be put in jail. And that is an amazing feeling because people like to fight for their rights. And this is all that the people, the Uyghur people should be also allowed to do that. You see, I just want to show you quickly. This is the book, can you see? That I have from, I can't see it properly, can you? Yes, we can see it. Plot star to pop star. And this is basically what it says it all. From wearing a yellow star, I was then a star star. But it never, I never forgot where I came from and what I went through. I, it, no day passes by that I, I'm not religious, by the way. I wish I was. I'm not. But I'm still grateful every day when I wake up that I'm still here. And I just want to have the same privilege for so many other people because they have got the same right as human beings. And I just thank all those young people who are so much involved in, the, in looking 
the advocacy that you are doing for the Holocaust and everything, and all those young people who are listening now, just pass the word on. All we need is people to stand up and talk for what is right, because you can. Don't be afraid. You might not be the flavor of the month, but you go to bed proudly and happily. Because time is now. If there's no time tomorrow and after tomorrow, if you want to have a tomorrow, we must achieve it today and work for it. Thank you very you much. A, you are doing a wonderful job as well. <laughs> and I mean, it must be quite difficult to, to do A-levels and to do bubble, bubble, <laughs> hubble, bubble. So, you know, I'm thank you very much. Thank you. Um, no, I really appreciate that. And I just want to say as a last couple of couple of words, I just wanted to sum up a couple of ideas that I, were, I was thinking about whilst this was going on. So yesterday we actually had the privilege to speak or show a tribute alongside Rehan at the five-year commemoration of Erkar's disappearance. And yesterday also marked 27 years since the Tutsi genocide, a genocide that killed at least 800,000 people with a tenth of their country being massacred, in which more than 250,000 people were thought to have been burned. And today, today's Yom HaShoah, or Holocaust Memorial Day, where we reflect on the six million Jews that lost their lives. One of my, um, one of my great grandparents, out of his nine siblings, seven were killed, with all of my grandparents families also being murdered in concentration camps and I've realized that unless people stand up against genocide the words yet again will remain hollow and it was actually last year when I went to Poland and I was listening to a really inspiring woman called Miroslawa who was not actually Jewish um, but she herself saved a Jewish girl um, by hiding her and I began thinking if I was in that same position what would I do in the time 83% of Americans were isolationists. Jews were turned back on, um, on ships heading to the UK, back to their imminent deaths to concentration camps. And I just wanted to be able to tell myself that if I was in that scenario, particularly if I wasn't a Jewish person, that I would actually get involved and I wouldn't just stand by. And that's what's really inspires me to get involved. And it's together with this and meeting Rehan and other Uyghurs and Holocaust survivors who have suffered and are currently suffering it's inspired me to get involved in fighting against the oppression of those who have suffered today. So I quickly, really quickly want to share with you something that we've been working on and some ideas for you to get involved. Can everyone see this? So this is a campaign that we recently did called our Free Ekpar campaign together <coughs> with Rayhan. And so often as was talked about, oh, sorry, I didn't realize you could see my screen again. Um, so often as was talked about, there's the constant dehumanization of people. And this really aims to put a face on genocide. So we got people from all around the world to hold up photos with Ekpar's poster. And we had people from 18 different countries taking part. If you can see alongside the front row, all of our ambassadors and team members as well, um, was kind of, kind of like the ones I'm wearing today. Um, and we were wearing them. And we had people from 18 countries in front of their Hanukkah decorations, their Christmas decorations from all over the world. It was really successful and picked up upon by lots of media outlets. And together with Rayhan, I think we really did put a face on the genocide that's happening and turn this into a really moving campaign. And it is through Rayhan that has really inspired me to, to do this and to want to work for, for this goal. She's just such, a, such an amazing individual. And I'd really recommend that anyone who wants to get involved reach out to, to us and you can see all of the hundreds of people, some of them just taking part in that photo. I wanted to talk about some other things that you can do as well. So this first thing is specifically aimed at young people who are here. So over this summer, when hopefully we'll have more time because exams will be done and I'm sure everyone's looking forward to that. Um, we are relaunching our ambassadorship programs. So if you're in years 11 to 13, do follow us on social media. I can put the links in the chat now. And then on that, it will be out when we're releasing the ambassadorship program. That's a good way of getting involved in the access sphere. Um, you'll be guided and be able to create content with ambassadors who have done interviews with guests, um, created organized events, created programs and featured in news outlets, etc. If you, if you don't feel like you've got the time, there's even really, really small things you can do. We recently set up a broadcast so every two weeks. We'll send you a WhatsApp message with either something to do or something to watch or something to read, just to make sure that you are actually getting involved. So this is for everyone, not just you. And it's 
a way in which we, even if you're really busy, if you're working in a job, it's something really small that you can do. And we're specifically targeting it to be something like that. Then, um, as was mentioned earlier, um, in regards to the Uyghur genocide, so um, we want support for the early day motion, recognizing the Uyghur persecution as a genocide. I was, um, I recently learned, actually, I think it was from me, there have been 13 genocides since the Holocaust and not a single one of them was classed as a genocide, was actually ongoing. And that really, really shocked me. And we, I think we have to change that legacy if we want to make yes again, more than just hollow words. Then also, I know Volkswagen was brought up several times during this talk. I, we need to challenge them and other business who operate within the Uyghur region using Uyghur forced labor. It's the same as, um, for example, Hugo Boss, who also were recently making headlines, is going to need a group effort. We've seen what's happened recently with H&M um, and Nike. And if you haven't, definitely check that out because that's really important. And then finally, um, the final thing I just wanted to mention was the Beijing Winter Olympics that are upcoming. It, I can't help it but have see parallels in my head or echoes of the past with 1933. And we need to brand this as the genocide game. This cannot be allowed to slide. We need to make this the best thing that happens from the Uyghurs to the Uyghurs by drawing the focus everyone I think can do and everyone can be talking about and branding it recently the US were talking about boycotting it we need to keep putting pressure and we need to keep fighting so that we're not simply being bystanders and not simply giving in to the pressure of these countries and now if individuals from um yes again and Rene Kassin also want to put their socials in in the chat definitely I would really recommend checking them out. They're two absolutely phenomenal groups. They've been of amazing help to us, both in guidance and support and collaboration. Um, and I've learned a huge amount from them. If it's not obvious, I'm, I've just turned 18 years old. So this is all quite quite new for me, but I'm learning a huge amount. And I really appreciate all their, their support. Um, so I think that was most, mostly that from me. Um, Rayhan, would you like some one, one final words to put in the chat? I, I just want to have one final uh, word. Um, you know, I think, you know, if anything I learned in life is like active listening is so important. And what I mean by active listening is like really listening to people's struggle because, it, you know, as I, I kept underscoring, it takes the courage to be vulnerable. And especially like, you know, I, I'm supposed to be a problem solver. Like I'm an attorney. I shouldn't, I should provide solution, not seek uh, support. But that being said, um, I'm so fortunate uh, to have been able to lean on to whether Jewish voices or these youth voices and, and to seek their support, but uh, their compassion. Because, you know, sometimes like I really try to reach out to Chinese people and ask them to be our advocates and urge their government, like, please, you've got to stop this. And sometimes it's been really difficult because they're like, what did your brother do? Like, you know, and like, and asking somebody, a victim's family, like, what did your innocent brother do? Like, that was very hurtful. And, but it, people who understand history repeating itself, this is happening in front of your eyes. Like, they don't ask these questions. They, they, they want to take away your pain, not to add additional pain to your suffering. So for me, like, that has been truly amazing to be able to lean on to by the Jewish community, youth community, but also just compassionate individuals. So I, I just want to say to everybody, thank you for listening. Um, it's, um, it's an honor because sometimes people don't even have a platform for your, for your voice to be heard. Um, so I really appreciate that. And I hope like, you know, I am able to continue to lean on to you and as well as my community. So thank you, Mia and everybody, Jonathan, um, and, and, and truly amazing work and you know, for your compassion, for your um, love and support and just being such a great ally that I could ever ask for. Thank you very much. And thank you to, again, just echoing that to, to everyone attending, really appreciate it, um, particularly, um, well, to, to everyone, but also I just want to point, um, make clear that there are a lot of youth on the, these calls. And I think for me, anyway, we're particularly focused on youth action and to turn up on a, on a school night or if you're on holidays as well is, is really impressive. And we, we need to get more youth involved because that is 
going to be the next big campaign where we are the, the future, I like to think. So we need to make sure that we live in a better world and that we continue to fight for the good fight and for what's right. So thank you very much, everyone, for attending. And I hope you found it as interesting, as inspiring as I did. Thank you, everyone. Like, like Dorit Thank said, so much. freedom is always worth fighting for. Good night, everyone. I... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Good you. Um, has this been recorded? Can we get a recording of it? Because I missed the beginning. Yes, it will be shared on the Rene Kassan website for probably within the next couple of days. Thank you. Thank you very much.